Your guitar is a delicate balance between what it's made of and how it's designed. All too often, the focus is only on what it's made of. What's the top? What's the back and sides? And the design elements get left in the dust. Well, that changes today because we're gonna be looking at four different design elements and how they affect your guitar. Some affect tone, some affect maintenance. You're also gonna find out how big of a role binding plays, and it's way more than looks. Hey, TAC family, welcome to episode 190 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is designed to bring fun, focus, and progress to your guitar journey through my weekly Guitar Geek list, plus success stories from your fellow TAC members. Quick question for you. Have you ever had an injury that has forced you to take some time off from playing guitar? Carpal tunnel surgery, arthritis, a broken digit? Unfortunately, that's the one I'm most familiar with. Well, you may feel like guitar playing as you know it is over, but that's simply not true. Today, you're gonna learn how to progress on your guitar even when you can't physically play. You're gonna be meeting TAC member Yuhan, who persevered after the doctor's orders forced him to take some time off from playing. Plus, you're gonna get your weekly dose of acoustic news you can use, which includes some of my and your musical friends, plus a guitar that you can take down a water slide. Yeah, I know, it's weird, but we'll get there. First, let's dig into the world of guitar specifications and the effect that they have on your guitar. I've got four specs in the design category that do indeed affect your guitar in ways that may or may not surprise you. So let's go ahead and dig in. One of the design elements is binding. And I, I keep bringing that up because you might think something like binding doesn't affect your guitar at all, but it does. We'll get there in a moment. First, let's start out with body size. Yes, design element number one is body size, and that truly affects your guitar even beyond its tonal implications. Check this out. Yes, of course, body size does indeed affect tone. The bigger the guitar, the broader the projection, the more bass, the more boomy it is. Think bigger body equals boomy. Think smaller body equals focused, very narrow projection, and kind of a, a sometimes more even tonal spectrum. But body size also affects comfortability if that's a word. It affects the comfort you have when you sit down with your guitar. If you're a big person, you can handle a bigger bodied guitar. However, if you're a smaller guitar player, handling a Gibson J200 might feel like a wrestling match. So yes, body size affects tone, but it also affects comfort. Moving on to design element number two, and holy smokes, is this one a can of worms. Bracing. Oh, wow. Can we talk about bracing for days and days and days? But I'm gonna simplify it as best I can right now into three different categories. You have bracing pattern, bracing placement, and bracing treatment. We're gonna start with bracing pattern because to me, that is the one that creates the most drastic changes. And we're gonna talk about three different bracing patterns. The first is X bracing. The second is ladder bracing. And the final one is V-class bracing, courtesy of Taylor Guitar. So X bracing is the one we're likely most familiar with. It's essentially, the braces look like an X. Easy enough. Ladder bracing is a bracing pattern that has braces that go across the top of the guitar. There's no X in sight. And V-class bracing, as the name suggests, is essentially a V with tone bars running from the top of the guitar to the lower bout of the guitar. So now that you know a little bit more about how the bracing patterns actually lay out inside the guitar, what tonal effects does it actually have? Well, first, let's go ahead and look at a guitar that is X-braced and see how that sounds. And we'll follow it up with a guitar that's ladder braced, and then we'll wrap things up with a guitar that's V-braced. So you can actually hear the difference between each and every guitar, and we're gonna do that right now. Now let's look at bracing orientation or bracing placement. And there's really two placements that I want you to be concerned with, two placements other than standard. And we're really referring to the X brace here. You can have a forward shifted X brace or you can have a rear shifted X brace. 
What do these do when it comes to the tone of your guitar? Let's look at forward shifted X bracing. That means the X is pushed more towards the sound hole. What that does is it opens up the lower bout, meaning there's more free area on the lower bout. It's less constricted. So you're gonna have a more responsive guitar. You're gonna have a bassier guitar. What does this mean for the player? Well, if you have a lighter touch and you have a more bassy and responsive guitar, you can play the guitar very daintily in some cases and still eke out every ounce of tone that you want. Conversely, a rear shifted bracing pattern tightens up the lower bout. It actually constricts it. And you might be thinking, well, why the heck would you wanna do that? Check this out. If you're a heavy handed player, a player that really likes to dig in, you're still gonna be able to pull bass out of a guitar. You're still gonna be able to pull volume out of a guitar. But what that rear shifted bracing does is it allows you to dig in without the guitar bottoming out, if you will. Sometimes if you're a heavy handed player and you play a guitar that has forward shifted bracing, it almost has a reverse effect. The more you dig in, the less sound or the more compressed it sounds. So that is bracing placement. And now let's wrap things up with bracing treatment. And there are really two options here. You have unscalloped bracing and you have scalloped bracing. Unscalloped bracing means that there's no wood removed from the bracing whatsoever. Oftentimes I refer to it as straight bracing. Whereas scalloped bracing still has structural integrity, but some of the wood is removed to reduce the weight on the top of the guitar, again, leading to a more responsive instrument, which for lighter handed players is a huge, huge benefit. But I wanna see if you can tell the difference. So we're about to look at a video of a very young Tony comparing a Martin D28, a straight brace guitar, versus a Martin HD28, a scalloped brace guitar. Take it away, young Tony. Design element number three is the neck joint. Now you might be thinking to yourself, oh, he's gonna be talking about the difference in sound between a dovetail neck joint and a bolt-on neck joint. I'm not gonna talk about the sound difference at all because in my experience, it has no true impact. And you might be sitting there thinking, oh, that he can't say that. Well, in my experience, again, I can't tell the difference if a guitar has a dovetail neck joint versus a bolt-on neck joint just by simply listening to it. If you can hear the difference, more power to you, you have much better ears than I. But what we are gonna talk about in terms of the neck joint is ease of maintenance. Over time, over the guitar's life, it will eventually need a neck reset, meaning the neck angle needs to be changed to maintain proper playability and optimal tone. What is a neck reset? Well, essentially the neck is removed from the acoustic guitar, the neck angle is changed, to accommodate for the guitar wanting to essentially fold in half over its lifetime. As the guitar wants to fold in half, I'm being dramatic here, once you change the neck angle, it actually flattens out the guitar again. Why does this make a difference? Well, when it comes to removing the neck, a bolt-on neck joint, in my opinion, is far superior because the repair person to do the neck reset, all they have to do is unscrew a couple bolts. And to show you how easy it is, here's James from Bourgeois Guitars demonstrating their bolt-on neck design. In the early 80s, Dana developed his detachable system, uh, which unlike a traditional dovetail, allows you to remove the neck from the guitar very, very easily, make any angle adjustments and reattach it equally easily uh, in order to maintain you know, the best leverage of the saddle to drive the soundboard. Uh, Dana's detachable joint has a number of other benefits, um, but primarily the easy neck reset is the key. It takes our technicians about 15 or 20 minutes to reset the neck angle. Again, the entire time maintaining a really nice, perfect saddle height. Not too tall, not too low. Now, just so you have all the information, we do have to look at the other end of the spectrum. So here's Joe Conkley from Elderly Instruments removing the neck on a guitar, a vintage Martin, that has a dovetail neck joint. down to the bottom of the dovetail joint, so that's a good sign. Okay. 
Now we're gonna look at design element number four, binding. Now you're sitting there thinking to yourself, yep, tone, let's move on. Binding changes the way your guitar looks. It's either framed in by a nice white or ivoroid binding, or it's not. Those are the two options. I'd like you to look at binding through a different lens. Okay, yes, it does have an aesthetic impact. There's nothing in my opinion that beats a nice dark sunburst and on the border of that nice dark sunbursted top, there's ivoroid binding. That to me is quintessential guitar geek magic. But again, let's look at binding through a different lens. Binding actually protects the joint between the side of your guitar and the top of your guitar, or the side and the guitar or the and the back of your guitar. Binding does offer some protection. There are some guitars that are unbound and I think those look equally cool. But when a wood on wood joint gets hit up against another guitar, a mic stand, the corner of a table, there's nothing absorbing that shock besides that wood on wood joint. And most oftentimes that can result in a dent or in worst case scenario, it actually can split the joint from the, the top being glued to the kerfing or the top being glued to the side. Whereas when you have a guitar that's bound, what absorbs that shock is a piece of binding. It could be wooden binding, it could be a celluloid binding, it could be just a simple plastic binding. I guess celluloid is a plastic. Anyways, what I'm saying is you have something to absorb that shock. So yes, binding makes your guitar look cool, but it also is a safety measure of sorts. So maybe consider that next time you're looking at a spec sheet or maybe comparing two guitars. One is, uh, doesn't have binding, the other one is $200 more, but it does have binding. You can get whichever one you want and I encourage you to get whichever one you want, but do know that that additional price does make the guitar look different, but it also serves a protective purpose as well. What did I forget? What's a specification that you think adds a huge tonal implication to the guitar, or rather affects the tone in a major way? Also, I'm open to questions. What's a guitar specification that you look at and you think to yourself, how does that impact your guitar in any way, shape, or form? Go ahead and let me know in the comments below. I'd love to create some discussion. I'd love to create some questions that I could answer on a future episode of Acoustic Tuesday. Let's talk about injuries, specifically hand injuries. Now, from a guitar player's perspective, this is a horrifying thought. Really, any injury is a horrifying thought, but when you use your hands to play the guitar and then you injure them and can't play, how on earth do you even get better? Can you even try and progress when you can't physically play the guitar? Well, the answer is yes. And I'm gonna share with you two stories right now, one from me and one from TAC member Yuhan. It's amazing what he did, and I'm so glad he shared his story because it's pretty amazing. We're gonna get to Yuhan in a moment, but let me tell you my story real quick. Uh, some years ago, I wanna say we're looking at maybe four to five years ago now, I was actually on my way to a gig, no joke, and I slammed my fretting hand in a car door. I don't know how I did it. I closed the car door with my left hand, and my left hand slipped off the car door, landed in the door frame, and then the door proceeded to slam on top of my hand. Not a good situation. Well, immediately I called Jim, the guy I was playing the gig with, and I said, I'm not gonna have a gig this morning. We played a coffee shop. I'm actually heading to urgent care because I hurt my hand. Get to urgent care, do the x-ray thing. Doctor says, I've got great news. You just broke the tip of your pinky finger. To which I replied, it's actually not awesome news because I play guitar for a living. He kind of said, oh, yeah, not great news at all. Well, immediately I thought, I'm not gonna be able to play anymore. This completely stinks. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Well, I started looking at the guitar differently. I actually, since my fretting hand was damaged, I really focused on my picking hand, different finger picking rolls, and even flat picking patterns. And in terms of my fretting hand, I couldn't use my pinky at all. So what I would do is visualize patterns on the fingerboard. This way I was kind of keeping my mind active and keeping, well, keeping my head in the game, if you will. Well, TAC member Yuhan did this very thing without even hearing my story. And I think all of us guitar geeks can be inspired by him and what he did. Despite the doctor saying, you can't play guitar for a minimum of two weeks. Here's what Yuhan did, check this out. So on the 21st of April, I went in for bilateral carpal tunnel release surgery. I was afraid of what effect it might have on my guitar playing. 
I was also not looking forward to the forced time I had to take off from playing to accommodate for the recovery. I am proud to say that I had my first playing session again today. It was the first time in two weeks. All went well. The fingers are a bit on the clumsy side and I have to build my playing time up again. Doctor's orders was to take it slow, five to 10 minutes at first and build on that each day. But I'm so glad to report that all went well and I can play again. I really missed playing. To keep my routine going in the off time, I tried to log into TAC every day at my set time and location. I watched the daily exercise and marked the ones I liked as favorites, even though I didn't play any of it. So glad to be back, a massive small win. A small win indeed, Yuhan. And again, I, I wanna thank you for sharing your story because what you were able to do can serve as an inspiration for those that might be going through the same exact thing you were meaning you have some sort of injury that limits your playing ability or allows you to not play at all. Yuhan kept his routine up. He kept logging in to Tony's Acoustic Challenge at the same time and in the same place to keep his head in the game. And he even took it one step further and said, even though I can't play that challenge, I'm gonna go ahead and favorite it so I can come back to it when I do start playing again. So I am so happy on, on so many fronts here. Uh, number one, Yuhan, great job getting back into the game. I'm so glad you're playing again. And even though your fingers are a little clumsy, it's so cool to hear that you can indeed play again. And then also the fact that you maintained your routine even during your downtime. Uh, it, it's really tough mentally to do that. And to hear that you did that and it, and, it, and, it, it, and it played out pretty well, is pretty darn awesome. So thank you so much, Yuhan, for sharing your story. Uh, congratulations, and hopefully the route to recovery continues and uh, you'll be playing just like you were, even better than you were before the surgery. Now I wanna shift gears. We're gonna go to uh, Clinton, Connecticut, I believe. I think it's Clinton, Connecticut. And we're gonna visit uh, Acoustic Tuesday viewer, Wes K. Wes K is here to share his guitar arsenal. And ladies and gentlemen, it is packed full of awesomeness. Here's what Wes has in his guitar arsenal. First, he says a little salutation here. Hi, Tony. I enjoy being a TAC member and watching the Acoustic Tuesday show each week. Although I have quit guitar many times over the years and a couple of guitars in my guitar arsenal were given to me by folks who themselves quit guitar, I feel like I am a player for life now. I recently bought a new guitar to celebrate my birthday and tac anniversary, so I decided to submit my guitar arsenal. The back row on the couch, we have a Siegel M6 Dreadnought, a La Patrie CW Hybrid Nylon String, an Art & Luthery Ami Parlor Guitar, a Penco A12 Dreadnought from the early 1980s. On the guitar stands, we have a Breedlove C25 CRH, a Gibson Les Paul Deluxe Gold Top from 1974, and finally, I'm holding my new Martin HD28 Sunburst because I am never gonna quit guitar again. Wes, this is awesome for so many reasons, one of which is that, that Les Paul Deluxe Gold Top from 74. I, I just thought, I think it's an amazing guitar. But secondly, I guess, yeah, there's three reasons. Uh, secondly, your array of guitars from the folks at, uh, at Seagull. Seagull, La Patrie, Art & Luthery. That's a pretty solid Canadian connection there. And then lastly, I think it's awesome to hear you say, you know what? I quit guitar a lot over the last few years, but I'm a player for life now. And I think that's, such an awesome declaration for you. I mean, and you're well on your way. You've celebrated your first tack anniversary, which is awesome. That's a year straight of playing, and you celebrated that with getting an HD28 Sunburst. Now you get to go to your guitar den, pick up a beautiful guitar, and play every day. So awesome. Thank you so much, Wes. And if you're sitting there thinking, I want to be like Wes, I want to share my guitar arsenal on the Acoustic Tuesday show, I'm telling you, I'm inviting you to please do so. Just follow three simple steps. Step number one, visit AcousticTuesday.store and pick out your favorite guitar arsenal shirt. Step number two, once that shirt arrives, put it on and take a picture amongst all of your guitars. Step number three, please upload your picture at AcousticLife.tv. Click on the submit link in the top menu, go ahead and upload your picture and let us know what's in your guitar arsenal. Let's go ahead and do the time warp again. I'm sorry, that was that was brutal. That was horrible. Um, let's go ahead and visit some comments from episode 
186 of the Acoustic Tuesday show where I talked about uh, effects pedals uh, and using them with your acoustic guitar. The first comment comes from Travis Nesbitt, and he says, I've started watching the show during my lunch break rather than listening to the podcast while driving to work. I love watching bobblehead Tony nod along to real Tony's comments when his hand gestures rock the table. Indeed, Travis, I do, uh, I do gesture with my hands quite a bit, and that does activate uh, mini Tony bobblehead. And it's nice, I gotta tell you, you know, when I say something and he, he nods in agreement with me, it feels good, it feels good. It, it feels like it validates what I'm saying. Uh, thanks for watching, Travis. Our next comment comes from Alan Bahati. And he says, I love this. I was just thinking about what pedals can be used on the acoustic guitar. Then I saw your video. Lovely. Uh, thanks so much for watching, Alan. I'm glad you got some use out of that episode. Our next comment comes from Acrobata. Acrobata? Acrobat. Hey, that's the screen name. <laughs> they say this. Hi, may I ask you something? Well, of course you can. Can I plug my electroacoustic guitar into a normal amp like my Vox AC10? Or must I have an acoustic amp to plug it into? Second question, can I plug my electroacoustic guitar into my pedal board that I use with my electric guitar? Because I have some of those effects you mentioned, like delay and reverb. I guess this must be kind of a silly question, but oh well, I don't know the answer. Uh, thanks for the help, greetings from Portugal. First of all, I have to say thank you for watching, and thank you for these awesome questions. So the first question, can you plug an acoustic guitar into a regular electric guitar amp? You can, but here's the fundamental difference. Electric guitar amps, in general, are meant to play pretty loud and oftentimes distorted or overdriven. That's not necessarily ideal if you want to maintain a pure acoustic tone. Whereas uh, acoustic guitar amps are designed to be played loud but maintain an acoustic guitar's tone. So there's, there's very much a difference. You can plug an acoustic guitar into an electric amp, but I'll tell you right now, it's probably not going to sound acoustic. It will likely sound a little bit more electric but it can be done. And if that's all you've got, give it a whirl. See if it works out okay. The next question, can I use my uh, acoustic electric guitar and plug it into my pedal board? Yes, you actually can, especially if you have effects like delay and reverb. In fact, a lot of those effects that I mentioned in episode 186 were designed for electric guitar, but they just so happen to be pretty useful in the acoustic guitar world. So great questions and I'm glad you asked because I know for a fact that question exists in a lot more guitar geeks' minds than, than just yours. So awesome, awesome question. Now our final comment comes from Attack member, uh, Adam Fisher, and he says this. I wanted to read this because I think it's so cool to kind of hear about his guitar journey and the effect the guitar has had on his life. Here's what he says. Just wanted to add something that I've never heard before. Guitar exposes our emotional issues. I've recently embraced guitar as meditation, but this is antithetical to my initial experience with guitar education. When I started learning, I was determined to master the guitar through hours of daily practice. I struggled with anger and impatience. I didn't feel like I got better and became increasingly frustrated with the pace of my progress. This turned out to be an indicator of disordered, overly critical self-talk. I finally realized that this problem was sabotaging my entire life. I'm now more focused on fixing my toxic internal dialogue, and guitar helps maintain that focus. The breakthrough came in my second year of TAC. I subscribed to TAC and stuck with it for three months. Then I dropped it. I renewed and finally fell into a guitar hole when I just closed my eyes and played the daily exercises over and over. I tried to increase speed little by little, but reel it back if it creates tension and anxiety. This results in more, not less progress. I love that the guitar is a portal to relaxation and focus now, instead of frustration and anxiety. Adam, a uh, huge thank you for, for your comment here. This is, this is indicative, I think, of, of a lot of pressure that, as guitar geeks, we put on ourselves. We should be better, we should be playing this, we should be faster. Uh, the operative term there being should. And what Adam suggests, and, and what I often, I, I suggest all the time as well, I was gonna say oftentimes, but I suggest it all the time, is to focus on having fun with your guitar. Focus on it serving the purpose that uh, it should be fun, it should be relaxing, it should be a form of meditation. The guitar should help you escape from daily stressors. It shouldn't add stress to your life. It shouldn't add you being critical of yourself. It should just simply be fun. And every new thing that you learn, every new thing that you play should be a small win. And it should just be 
simply fun. I guess that's the bottom line, and Adam is, is, is proof of that. So Adam, thank you so much for your comment. I certainly uh, appreciate you, you sharing some insight into your guitar journey. Judging by what's left in my coffee cup, it is now time for acoustic news you can use. Yes, the final segment of the Acoustic Tuesday show today, and wow, have I got some news nuggets for you. The first one comes from my dear friend, Charlie Parr, and I want you to mark your calendars for July 30th because he's releasing a brand new album on that day. July 30th marks the release of his new album, Last of the Better Days Ahead, his first release on the Smithsonian Folkways label, and holy smokes, am I excited for this album. I just heard the very first single released from that album, which ironically is titled Last of the Better Days Ahead. And the video is amazing. It had me nearly in tears, as did the song. I want you to listen to this song multiple times. We're gonna listen to a little chunk of it here, and uh, it is one of the finest songs I have ever, ever heard. So with that all being said, let's go ahead and listen to Last of the Better Days Ahead, written by Charlie Parr, coming out on his new album, July 30th. Well, now you start to panic and your gas is running low And you need to find some meaning for your stranded on the road And the engine finally dies near a soybean field of dust You just sit and watch the sunset turn the entire sky to rust Turn the entire sky to rust Turn the entire sky to rust what a beautiful song. If you want to pre-order Charlie's new album, you can do so through his site or, of course, the Smithsonian Folkway site as well. Moving on to our next piece of news, this comes from Emerald Guitars. Now, about a year ago, I announced that they were developing a Weisenborn model. Well, the time is here. They just announced the Solace Weisenborn made of carbon fiber. What a cool instrument. They did a launch video for this. And we're gonna have a quick sneak peek of it right now. In fact, there's a very important announcement in this video. So perk your ears up, not only for the instrument, but also for what Alistair announces. Check this out. I'm very excited to be playing some stuff on it. It's fantastic after all these years to see the, finally the fruition and the, the initial request was there. And here we are years later, looking at the final, uh, the final finished guitar, Alistair. Fantastic. Yeah, we, we, but when you ask that uh, question, you never expect to be here 20 years later helping launch go. it. Yeah, and it seems like yesterday. Yeah, it's, it's not so long ago. <laughs> not so long ago at all, so. So you can check that out on our 3D Builder. Um, we've just added this into the, the 3D Builder platform at emeraldguitars.com. So please check it out there. You'll get to see all the curves and the contours and the different options uh, in terms of uh, pickups and hardware and that sort of thing. There's a little bit more to the story as well. So right back last year, uh, I decided I'm gonna do something special with this ongoing. So I've always wanted to have uh, a step side truck, an old vintage American step side truck and, uh, and have it as the Emerald Guitar shop truck. So we decided that what we would do is whenever we build a Weisenborn, whenever we sell our Weisenborns, we're going to put the pre proceeds of that aside and we're going to buy the Emerald truck. But not only that, we're actually going to go to the States. So, uh, so Mark, myself and you are going to go to the States uh, sometime next year, we're going to go to the USA, we're going to do a road trip, we're going to find a truck that's going to become the Emerald Guitar Shop truck, and uh, we're going to play some music along the, the way, and uh, head on down Route 66. Head on down Route 66. So we're going to carry this story on, it's been exciting bringing it so far, and it's going to be pretty cool to be able to take that a little bit further. So. Uh, yeah. So into 2022, all being well, and uh, we're allowed to travel, we're going to do a road trip across the US. Our final piece of news comes from none other than Molly Tuttle. She just released a three song EP entitled, But I'd Rather Be With You Too, which is a follow up to her full length album, But I'd Rather Be With You. This EP contains three songs and in each song she's paired with an artist, Madison Cunningham, Nathaniel Rateliff, and Iron and Wine, Sam Beam from Iron and Wine. In fact, that's the exact song you're gonna listen to right now. This is Molly Tuttle and Sam Beam from Iron and Wine playing the song, you don't get me high anymore. Nothing is fun, not like before. You don't get me high anymore. Used to take one, now it takes four. You don't get me high anymore. And 
I think on that note, it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show. Now, before I officially wrap up the show today, we do have to take a sneak peek into next week and guess what next week's show is going to be all about. Next week, it's all about Molly Tuttle. Yes, indeed. We're going to look at Molly Tuttle's claw hammer guitar style specifically. In fact, next week's episode, by the end of next week's episode, you'll be able to play claw hammer guitar and you'll get a full dose of Molly Tuttle as well. Yes, that's all happening next week on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday here on YouTube at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. I wanna thank you so much for joining me today, and please remember that your guitar progress, your guitar success, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day you play. Thanks again for joining me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek. Guitar Geeks Unite, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers. Thank you.